Hello and welcome. I'm Marianne Fezenden from AMTS and this is the Nutritionist webinar. For this May webinar, we will watch a presentation by Dr. Vadim Bakchevnikov, our distributor in Russia. Vadim received his DVM from Don State University and Perzhanovsky Rostov Oblast. In addition to acting as our distributor in Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, Vadim manages Nova Lab, manages and consults on dairies in Russia, Ukraine, and here in the U.S. at Beaver Creek, an 8,200 cow dairy in Michigan. Vadim will first tour us through Beaver Creek, giving us an extraordinary look at grouping, fresh cow management, repro, and herd health, and just how you do the daily task on a farm that large. Vadim will also give a quick overview of Legend, a Russian dairy. Finally, he finishes up with some ration evaluation. Vadim and I work together to stitch many small videos into one cohesive whole, so I've created some bridging slides when we change. I hope you enjoy this unique opportunity and remember to save your questions for the end, writing them in the Q&A or chat window as they occur. Well, thank you for the uh, presentation, Marianne, and, and um, good evening or good day, everybody. And I wish you have a better, warmer day than we have in Michigan right now. It's May 5th, and it's really cold. Look at me. I'm with a jacket. Cornerstone nutritionist, by the way. It's uh, our nutritionist here, Nathan Musi. Hello, buddy. So I'll uh, give a little presentation at the um, dairy right now. I'll switch the camera so I'll show the barn instead of my face and then I will um, make a little tour and then I'll explain what we have here. So this is one of my largest barn here with uh, 600 to 750 cows in each pen. Four groups so you can see on the right and the left side. Every group has a own color. This is a breeding groups. Well, let me say few words about this dairy. Like Marianne write it down, it says probably it's 8,000 cows, it's a little bit more. It's 8,200 cows right now with a four um, milking parlors. It's a double eight, double ten, double thirty-six, and double sixty. But right now we have 29% of uh, first lactation animals and um, 2.6 lactation on average if you take all cows together with a production about 82 pounds. We are dropped lately about five, six pounds because of uh, lots of things. We can actually discuss later about this, why we drop in milk production. So the groups on uh, this dairy are formed by a uh, reproduction stage, I would say. So grouping cows, we divided cows on the first lactation, open cows, and two plus open cows. Primarily it's a 32 to 3500 cows right now on the repro status is uh, between two and four. As Soon as a cow gets pregnant, we move here to other groups together. First and plus lactations, that'll be form pregnant cows. On a whole entire dairy, we're using one cow diet um, which is fed to every cow, depends, doesn't matter if she milks, let's say 55, 60 pounds or it's a uh, over 140 pound cow, same one diet. Uh, we do have a fresh cow diet, so don't take me uh, wrong. Fresh cow, we make just on purpose of uh, low forages on a high lactating cow's diet, a one cow diet. We added a little bit forages up to 50%, so to fill them a little bit better. Uh, but many, many years in a row, we used the high cow diet to the all groups, including fresh pen. What else? Um, about call rate, uh, currently, there's a cow in heat. Currently, we have about 26% of call rate on the cows. Um, with a hospital, 
um, average of 100 cows, of total 80 to 100 cows, which is a little bit high. And the major problem, the cow must leave the herd. It's uh, mastitis, food problems, and then a little bit of pneumonia. This is the three major uh, reasons cows leave the herd. And uh, very low injuries as well with the legs probably. So what else? Um, the, the death loss at the birth uh, within 4%. With the production I probably told about it, it's 82 pounds. And we are, we had a lot better productions than we do right now. Uh, oh boy, we turned the fans on and it's still cold yet. But air quality for us is a prime primarily thin so better fresh air instead of uh, warming cows what is interesting about this dairy is we don't grow our calves on the farm here uh, within uh, one or two days fresh uh, as soon as they fed two colostrums they go into grower Whereas they stay from age two days till five months, and after that they move to another grower, which is uh, stays till they get uh, 60 days prior to freshening, and then they come back to us. This is poor girl in heat. This is the first lactation animal on the right side. Um, you can look at the body condition score, and then the feed quality. It's the same diet from. Uh, High cow diet, first lactation, um, this is a second plus lactation cows. Um, right now I walk in through the pregnant cows, it is an older facility with uh, 430 cows on each pen on the left and on the right. This is a totally pregnant cows, they waiting to be confirmed. P2s and confirms, and then after this group, they never move, go to the dry cow pen. For our entire lactation, we try and move cows as less as possible within a first move from fresh pen to breeding group, then from breeding to pregnant, and that's it. From pregnant, they go to dry pen. This is a close-up diet, the pre-fresh, 21 days prior to freshening pen. Uh, right now it's about 600 cows here in the one pen. The diet looks okay, but I still I would like to see its straw a little bit smaller, because few pieces is getting a little bit too long. They do, they do a little bit sorting, and then um, as of today, first day, I add more water so i bet there will be less than 40 percent right now and then with a the hot weather hopefully it stay wet enough till uh, 24 hours a day uh, intake is about 28 pounds right now per cow which is not too bad on this diet this is a one cow diet for far off and pre-fresh with a calcium about 56 55 grams per head per day probably i'll be jumping back and forth with my video presentation but uh, this is a fresh pen that's how it looks like for us there's a two cows divided on two pens one of them freshening another one this one is just empty we move them to fresh pen uh, right after delivery i can uh, show a little bit uh, how we use a setup here 
actually friendly for cows like it it does does work uh, we have a drinker in the middle so access for both cows and then sometimes we put a little feed for cows because they stay literally here a few hours they usually don't eat but we provide them the food as well and then um dry straw bedding believe me guys i was not ready for a video today it just like every day that's what we have love to check it just standing on the knee and then stay about one minute if your knees is dry we're good um this is a baby already on the ground a few of them carrying um, another door this is a calf facility i'll show you later this is where we are um, helping the uh, calf uh, helping cow if she has a hard delivery there is a feed truck where they're feeding cow sorry for noise and then uh, on top of it it's just a little vacuum motor and then uh, we individually milk cow here in the same station we lock here we check um, give them boluses assist them and then uh, let them go and then if cow missing a red band we add a red band because every fresh cow we have two red bands on one leg if you'll see on the dairy two red bands on each leg one red band this is mean a treated cow if two leg two red bands on one leg it means fresh cow so how that looks like on the freshening and of course little kitties and then uh, this is a facility where we are working with the paperwork, um, keeping warm in colostrum, get uh, all the uh, information, write it down, uh, checking colostrum as well, and the quality, right, right, in case we need it. This is how we get it for colostrum. In the same position, we we'll clean the teeth very nice. Oh, yeah, she would love to milk. Check for any mastitis or uh, changes in the milk. Here is a newborn baby calves. Every calves we fed with a colostrum two times and then a third time milk if they a little longer than two days. <clears throat> and then uh, electrolytes. Uh, every calf and fed colostrum once, it's got a blue mark on the head. And if you'll see the second mark, two dots. That's um, blue and red. That's how we control that fed second time colostrum already. As I said uh, before, they stay in here uh, just a couple days, maybe just the fed colostrum twice, and then move to grower. This is strings we're handing out uh, just for heat lamps in the winter time. And then uh, what's extremely warm, we turn the uh, fans and it becomes like a tunnel ventilated facility for us. Every Monday we do the hair health with the veterinarian. Um, on the right side, if you see the cows just came from a fresh pan, I mean from milking, and on the left side, they just been scraped and ready for uh, headlocks is set. So, as soon as they'll show up, we'll start to uh, do the prep check for them as well. <clears throat> this cow will be started in a few minutes, and then uh, I'll show you how the procedure we follow to the her house. Good morning, everybody. I'm, uh, I have a little sleeve on my hand, and then I want to show you. I want to show you just a few minutes how we work with the fresh pan. Later, we'll discuss about it, and then I'll um, give you more details. But for now, better one time see than hundred times hear it. So, this is a fresh pan, and then uh, three people, usually four people. Today, we're a little short, so I'm a fourth person. 
for people works like uh, like this. We are using markers on the back to check the cow, how many days is she, and then uh, all different color means something for. I'll explain it later if we'll have a questions. So, so on the back you see the data fresh, like 30. She is a three days fresh, and uh, we'll uh, talk about this a little later. So this cow fresh yesterday on first and so on um, there's a few words about reproduction we use a simple water-based paint every color for each group um, there is a usually three person per pan one with a handheld one with a I mean two with a paint and then now uh, once we walk by we Check the old cows in heat. If, she, if someone in heat, we'll send her to the other side, lock her in a headlock and breed them. And cows not, they simply lay down, nobody even touch them. It takes about 30 minutes per group with um, 650, 700 cows in a pen. I didn't finish about prep check. So cows are standing here. We're trying our best so cows shouldn't be locked more than two hours entire time for a prac checking and then um, they have plenty feed and then uh, because of a little bit too many cows in the one pen we divided them on two sections cross over gates are locked on the entire side we check the cows on one side and then uh, start getting check cows on the other side cows in heat we are breed them immediately and then the uh, cows open we'll give them a sequence of shots I'll explain later if you have a question what kind of program we use so you can see that person already working on it this is a better angle view and maybe less noise the guy is doing prep check one guy in front with a handheld Dr. John Skillen and the two assistants. They have all kinds of stuff like paint, drugs, vaccines. And then while we skin cows, figure out which one we need on the list. Um, he's saying the guys behind one needs to be done. Like this cow, for example, need a loot too, let's see. John duplicated number, this one cow G. So make sure every shot is given the right cow in the right direction. Like this cow for prep check. So uh, this procedure, how it work, um, allows us to check about 3,500 cows within four, maximum five hours. So this cow opens, she needs a shot a little less. Oops. Sign an L on the back. And, uh, another guy, give you shots, down the go. And the number on the back of side of the cow, number six, is that uh, Thursday, and she'll be breed on the off-sync day. And she get a loot shot as well today. Mm -hmm. Wednesday night, afternoon, she'll get a shot of generation, Thursday will be bred. Pregnant cow, we mark on the back blue line. So we know she's pregnant, she can be moved easily in other pregnant groups. About grouping cows, I'll tell you either before or later this video. This is a uh, before or later generation of this video. So that's a very simple and very doable for most of them there is and very efficient for me because like literally we can do a lot with a short time of with a short period of time and the last people as possible we can get. Cow pregnant, blue marker as well. It's very quiet right now because uh fence not working. No flies, no bunching. Cows doing wonderful right now. I like how they perform. The hospital getting lower and lower every day. But anyway, we had a few warm days and I already started working on a fly sprayer. Get the herd control, fly control as soon as possible. Because of, uh, I believe 
sooner you start working with the fly, don't even let them uh, exist on the farm. Killed a few of them at the beginning, uh, kill, you kill them, millions of them later on. So uh, that's, uh, we work on it. Right now it's so unusually quiet in the basement. This is a double 60 parlor. <clears throat> we have a little project here going on. So don't worry about the hanging out the wires. We are rewiring identification of the cows because we had issues when they were upstairs with lots of shaking and movement. We were missing a few data. So we decided to put it on downstairs in the basement. <clears throat> so it's a double 60 double 60 milking parlor works very well i like it within since uh, 2016 we never had an issue with that it works pretty well and still fresh looking milking parlor within uh, five minutes it'll be lots of noise and lots of milk going on through the pipes uh, every day we shipped about close to 600,000 pounds of milk. So this parlor sees milk, lots of milk. This is a double 60 milking parlor right now. I'll show you the whole picture, how it looks from back to the front. Uh, we have six people right now milking, but um, literally we can, going on with the five the one person spent quite enough time to switch the tanks and then uh, when we have a lunch the five person employees still in the basement like milking and now one by one they go have a lunch during shift so we milking three times from 5 to 1, from 1 to 9, and from 9 to 5 within 3 washing cycles and then 2 shifts from 5 to 5 uh, Well, there is a management of sand as I said before, we're using recycled sand and uh, 18 cent once a week, just about a few inches. On this side looks a little darker. When it gets uh, drier, it'll be a little bit light up. But um, one person does his job for uh, once a week for each group. It's about a couple, three inches on the side. I'll be trying to be quiet so I'm not hear much of it. I hope there is not too much wind and you can steal me very well. This is our kitchen. On the left side you can see I show you corn silage of 2020 and in the middle of the pile this is a premix, super mix or just a simple mix we make on the farm every afternoon to the, till, to the next day. Um, on the right side I'll move slowly you'll see the commodity that's a stuff where we can make a mix as well we are use the two trucks um, the feed trucks and one pool type pool type is most of the time used for uh, mixing super mix it and um, two trucks is to feed an entire dairies also we bring in for uh, evening, like uh, you see right now, the person picked it up the sample, probably gonna get the dry matter for tonight, so we'll feed it tomorrow. It's a 
heel iets, heel veel voor heel iets. Dit is de laatste load we maken voor um, dry cows. We start feeding with a fresh pen and high lactating cows and finish it up with a far off and close up. That's the last group of that. So what kind of ingredients we use uh, for feeding our cows? This is a corn silage, haylage, this is a straw, on the right bay from right to the left, this is a mineral lot, canola. I mean a plus, hominy, dry corn, wheat meat, and on the left bay, the last one, this is the soy hulls. And on everything on top of it, we are adding condensed whey, which is about 18% of dry matter. And we're adding it uh, as fat, about 15 pounds. So it's quite a bit wet, I mean, uh, not as wet like you think, about 46% of dry matter, what do we have? On the end. And then when we mixed, then we unload it to the middle of the pile, on the middle of the yard for feeding for tomorrow. Uh, somebody will say, why are you doing this? Is that your premix getting warm at the summertime or it's getting moldy and starts smelling? Heat up. Not at all. I don't know magic trick. Maybe because of uh, this whey condensed contains lots of sugar and it uh, works like a preservative. Don't know why, but it does work. We never had an issue with that. We're using it about for three years in a row with uh, great success. The dry cow diet is a very simple diet. It is a corn silage, straw, prairie hay. You may saw it in the video where we move it. And um, a little bit of Anina Plus, the rocks, minerals, vitamins, and uh, water to make it moist, uh, acceptable. That's about it. Well, hello again. For you, just a blink of an eye. For me, we just jumped to Russia. This is a very nice managed dairy. Let's say like this. It's a 1,200 cows um, with a 1,000 milking cows right now. With a, a fairly good production is a 34 kilos per cow. With an average of dairy production is about 18 to 20 kilograms. So 34, you can imagine, is quite tough. It's quite a lot. But there is a several dairies in Russia that could be producing close to 4,500 kilograms. So this is a let's say like this average if you manage by productions. Um, they're using 100% double offsing and with a good preg rate, it's about 28%. And then um, on the 34 kilograms, they have 4.1 butter fat and 3.3 protein. You can see the very typical housing for cows as a mattresses stalls. This is a good bad. You can. Uh, we know for cows it's not an excellent um, housing, but uh, this is a very popular to Russia. On the top of a mattresses, they add in uh, limestone once in a while to keep it clean and a little bit sanitized. Somatic cell is below 300, which is good. There is a room for improvement. And the body condition score on the cows, some of them at the beginning video, you see they're a little bit um, chubby, but not extremely fat. And this cows is uh, probably on the peak in lactation. They look okay to me. Um, it's still cold over there, so you see the curtains is closed. And then now, uh, on the will be better if we'll add additional fans it seems like we need to add it more uh, to air quality it's not enough obviously not enough in the hot days you see that's very fair but building is strong the push feed you can see in the back we'll see it closer there technique of the push feed is very similar like we have in the united states uh, they using jcb skid loader here and then even he is pushing right now the feed is actually 
very available for a cow, so they still reaching. They have no issues um, of struggling not to have feed. Um, what else you can say about this dairy? Uh, there, are even brushes you can see in the side. It's uh, like a, for uh, comfort. There is a milking parlor. You can see it's a carousel. It's an unusual carousel. They use milk cows from inside, not outside. And then what is interesting to Russia, this is a woman. There, if you lo walk on a dairy, I would say 99.9%, you'll see the milkers is the only woman. Uh, I don't know why, but that's what it is. And then the calves, they work with um, girls as well. There's um, three people inside. Um, like I said, they milk in a thousand cows about within seven hours, so they have plenty time for it. And then if you have a cow that not wants to milk, we put the kicker on it and it, it works. Well, once she's done milking, we'll take it out. What I want you to pay attention, uh, like not attention, just look uh, the washer dryer inside and what's interesting is uh, using sanitizer to clean the units after each milking. It goes through the several basses with a water and a milk acid. So on the end, milkers is actually, hopefully it's perfectly clean. This is actually really helped to, um, to this dairy to drop some attic cell from 400 to close to 300. This is a cabin facility. I would say they looks wonderful to me besides very low ceiling in the hot days which is not quite often happened this area but it could be a little bit too hot for calves and there is no fence it's still open facility but no fence there are plastic uh, hutches works very well and what I don't like it here too this is a very powdery starter for them we use a little bit different type here in the United States but calves is really healthy and uh, dead on arrival DOB is uh, less than 3% and then the survival rate by 60 days is uh, 98% so they really do well managed uh, calves here and you see the hatches is like uh, upside down so they don't touch the noses and then of course uh, a woman the girls everywhere she's feeding calves We're using the milk taxi we call it and then uh, with a dolson <laughs> she cannot reach it that's what she says just wait relax um, they feed in uh, perfect amount uh, I think it's about eight kilograms a day so four kilograms twice a day feeding four kilos uh, four liters of per feeding uh, with um, about 800 and over 850 grams of uh, gain um, this is unusual too for uh, for me at least the feeding type how they do feeding this is a very common to Russia mixer that's self loading and to me it, it works amazing I, I just see the two downsides so first of all it's a little bit slow I, I like to see it faster but and uh, if it breaks it breaks forever everything like we on most of them there is in the uh, United States we're using loader and a mixer it's better if it's a pool type mixer and, uh, because if something broke you can divide it the parts and keep going like here if you lose a tire for example <laughs> you're losing completely feeding um, but the shrink and the losing the feed and the loading is extremely nice so I I prefer to keep um, I, I like I like what they're doing so it's just a time this is an issue so um, Well, thanks a lot for watching this short presentation about Beaver Creek Farm Dairy in the United States and then uh, Legendary in Russia. 
Uh, at the end, I want to show you diets what we're feeding in a Beaver Creek farm. So, as I said before, we have literally three diets on the farm right now. This is a dry cows, fresh cows, and a one lactating cow diet. So, this is a lactating cow, uh, sorry, fresh cow diet. So, what do we have? Corn silage, haylage, wheat straw, and um, super mix. In the super mix, we have a grind corn, canola, wheat meats, hominy, whey condensed, amino plus, and soy holes. You can see it's a very little inclusion, just seven pounds. Um, on the side, we have milk, 15, 19 pounds. Dry matter is about 45%. Forages, that's what it, very um, uh, interesting why we do it 54%, because um, something between high cow diet and then a dry cow diet. So crude protein is keep around 16% soluble. You can see what you want to see here. That's um, NFC is about 43%. Lots of sugar because it goes from a whey condensed. If you remember, I'll show you in a video. And then uh, just uh, starch is um, about 26%. Yeah, almost 27%. So, and um, high the cow diet, it's the next diet what we have is um, simple corn silage. We have two sorts of corn silages and then uh, haylage. Um, it's in metric, so it's in the kilograms. Four kilos of each, two kilos of haylage, super mix. In the super mix, same as in the fresh diet. Ground corn, canola, wheat meats, hominy, whey. Amino plus and a little bit of soy holes. It's balanced to almost 100 pounds, um, 45 kilos. Sorry, I'll check that to English. It's a balance about um, 100 pounds of milk. We are peaking maybe 100 pounds of milk, but right now the average lactation production is about 82 pounds. And uh, Dry matter is about 48%, very accurate, by the way, and forages is about 40%. That's why we decided to make a fresh cow diet, something between our dry cows and then the high lactating cows. Crude protein is a little bit high, but it's not that high if you check the manure, which we're doing periodically, check the um, high cow diet and the manure. So manure and then a... a Crude protein in the manure is very low, so it doesn't really affect some high crude protein in the diet. Um, what is uh, really low? It's a PENDF. Butter fat is right now, it's about 3.65, 3.7, and the total herd is about 3.8, 3.9, if you'll take it for expectation and other farms. This is uh, um, what we feed and then what do we deal with? The fat is about 4.3%, NFC is 43.9%. It seems high, but cow doesn't show that it's high. Sugar is about 9. I don't know who feeds 9 sugar, but we do. And starch is 27.8. That's what kind of diet we have. Manure, by the way, I don't know if you'll see it or not, looks wonderful. They are um, chewing cut uh, about 60, 65% all the time. So I don't see any signs of issue on the health related to the diets. And then um, we'll, uh, we have a dry diet, it's a dry cow diet. One cow diet for a far off and pre-fresh. It's still kind of close up, but it's one cow diet. Um, corn silage, prairie hay, wheat straw, grass haylage. I mean a plus, and I forgot to mention when I did a video that we do add a little bit of soy holes. 28 pounds, they do eat at 28 pounds. Uh, I fed about 110% of the total global feeding, and uh, we have less than 3% leftovers. So calcium, because it's a uh, we still feeding, trying like a low calcium diet. Um, so we'll see that what's a um, total calcium in a diet. Crude protein close to 14%. NAL 0.62 if somebody looking on this 
number starch is really low 10.28 and see what's a calcium gram 50.5 i told you probably in the video 55 but it's lower than that 50.5 it's higher than we want to see um, like a Nathan Musi, he would like to see it less than 40% probably. Phosphorus with the calcium is uh, significantly low, we would like to see as well. Potassium and the magnesium, uh, maybe just even low potassium, so I like it. It's as low as it's possible can be. But I know Dr. Gordy Jones, he would say he likes to see it 4 to 1, so we close, almost close. And then, so on this diet, when cow is not overcrowded, we're doing pretty well. Right now, we have probably about 2% of uh, DAs, and um, milk fever is still quite high, probably about 5%. So that's what we feed in a Beaver Creek farm. And then a quick, I'll switch to Legend Farm in Russia. Unfortunately, it will be in Russian language, but um, I'll try to explain. Let's figure out. It's in English. I'll put it in the metric because we use the metrics in Russia. So the straw, we add in straw about half a kilo. Haylage, silage. Uh, we add in fat. We add in uh, beet pulp, canola meal, a little bit of urea because the protein was a little lower on the diet. Canola meal, uh, uh, this is a soybean meal, barley, wheat, and corn, about 4.7 kilos of corn, and the wheat is about half a kilo. And on the right side, it balances 39 kilos. This dairy right now is about 34, 35 kilograms, and then a peak and a good, maybe less than a month ago, it was uh, almost 37 kilograms, so that's balanced pretty close. <clears throat> Crude protein is 16.6. What else we can see here? What do you like to see? Mm, fat is 3.83. NFC is quite high, 45%. But fat on these cows is 4.1, if you can imagine that, with a, that's such a high NFC. That's kind of weird, but cows seems like it. And then uh, protein is about 3.3%. Um, what, um, what do you want to see here else? The starch, total NFC, but then on the starch, just the starch. Sugar, poor low, 3.21. Fermentable starches. Just touch over 20. Yes, starch is 29.44. So almost 30%. Cows doing wonderful. They're a little bit fat, if you'll see in the video. But again, it's uh, they're liking it. Uh, using two diets for far off and pre fresh. So this is a far off diet with uh, five pounds of five kilos of straw. Haylage, four pounds, four kilos, a uh, little bit of corn silage, two pounds, and uh, soybean meal. Nothing else, nothing else. And uh, adding canola meal, 0.4 pounds. No grains, nothing. 12 kilograms intake, which is a little bit lower than should be. But they, they seem like perform very well. Crude protein is 13%, and it sees, you'll see it here, whatever, whatever you're looking for, because I am usually look at the far off of total NEL, uh, how many calories they eat per day, and the intake, this is a more important for me. So the total in NEL, we can calculate it quick, I don't want to take you too much time, 1.37 by 12 kilograms, I'll take a calculator quick. Okay, 1.37 by 12 kilo. So it's 16.4 megacal per day. I think it's wonderful for dry cows. So we'll hope they eat 12 kilograms and we'll be happy. <clears throat> and then a close up diet. This is um, 4 kilos of straw, uh, 5 kilos of silage, and um, here's a 2 kilos of uh, soybean meal. 
Ooh, this is what I don't like it. A little bit of grain of corn, 250 grams. Intake is 1100, 11 kilograms. So on the right side, uh, forage is 78%, crude protein is 14, starch is 17.7. .7. That's probably was a point why we added corn, but I don't like it see it here at all. Um, calcium. This is a low calcium diet as well. Calcium gram is 33.5 and phosphorus lower than calcium. Ah, about the same, 33.8. So in the potassium and magnesium, seems like in a normal place. They doing not bad at all. Occasionally, when dry matter intake drops, we start seeing a little issues, but that's usually not quite often happen. So that's that's about it, what I want to show you on the diets on these two dairies. And then I believe if you have a questions, I'll give it to word to Marianne, and then um, we'll start from that. Okay, thank you, Vadim. I hope our watching audience got as much out of that presentation as I did. Rarely do we get a chance to see such a transparent tour of large dairies and such openness in diet evaluation. I'm sure there will be a number of follow-up questions, but before we open the floor, I will mention upcoming webinars, introduce my co-hosts, and thank the webinar sponsors. Firstly, for those of you who are feeding sheep as well as cattle, please remember to mark your calendars for next Thursday when John Winchell of Alltech will join us for our final, this spring, webinar focusing on feeding sheep for both meat and milk production. John lives in Eden, New York. For those of you unfamiliar with upstate New York, this is dairy country, and has been a nutritionist with Alltech since 2016. A graduate of The Ohio State University, he has worked in dairy nutrition for 25 years, focused on forage quality for the last 20. John has found himself taking on sheep nutrition in the past few years and joins us on May 20th at 8 a.m. to share his thoughts on using the AMTS small ruminants model and formulating sheep diets in production settings. On June 10th, we're happy to bring back Dr. Rick Grant, director of the William H. Minor Institute in Chazy, New York. This will be Rick's third The Nutritionist webinar, and if you're familiar with his research and presentations, you know why. Rick and I will be going cow-side to look at ways animal behavior and comfort can affect production and health. That webinar will be 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. You can register for these two and any of our other webinars by visiting the agmodelsystems.com webpage and looking under the Nutritionist 2021 webinar tab. Finally, a Save the Date webinar taking place June 17th, AMTS, in conjunction with the Canola Council of Canada, will host a webinar featuring Dr. Chioke Benchar, a research scientist at the Sherbrooke Institute and Development Centre of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. His timely topic will be dietary options to reduce enteric methane emissions from dairy cows, with the ongoing discussions of how animal agriculture affects climate change, this will be very interesting indeed. His webinar will be 9 a.m. More information can be found on our website. Always, you can email me directly for additional information or to sign up. I am thankful for my co-hosts who share the task of fielding questions and bringing global insight to our webinars. The webinars are organized and produced by AMTS USA and Global. Our usual co-hosts are Dr. Elena Bonfante, AMTS Italian distributor and partner in Dairy Innovations with Dr. Bill Prokop. We are also joined by our distributor in Turkey, Dr. Huday Kavustran, Dr. Sean Lee of Ansi Tech in China, and Marcelo Hens Ramos of 3R Lab in Brazil. Dr. Marcos Neves Piera of the Universidade of Lavras in Brazil also joins with excellent insight and questions. I have no desire to do these webinars without the help and support of longtime collaborator Paula Turillo of Afina, who hosts the series as El Webinar del Nutritionista. 
She receives support from Rock River Lab in Argentina and is ably assisted by Paula Alanis translating. Vadim Bekchevnikov often joins as a co-host but had the truly heroic task of presenting this month. Vadim is our Russian distributor. We are especially thankful to generous sponsors who make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsors, Arm & Hammer, Animal and Food Production, hashtag Science Hearted, the Canola Council of Canada, learn more about feeding canola at canolamazing.com, Adina, experts in animal nutrition with expertise in plant bioactives, and Proteca, transforming the future of farm animal health. Our silver sponsors are Aginomoto, superior nutrition through amino acids, and Virtus both of whom have been sponsors with us from the start. Also, the Forage Analysis Labs of Dairyland Laboratories and Dairy One, both with affiliates around the world. Adiseo, Ruminant Nutrition Solutions to Ensure Animal Performance, and Micronutrients, Feeding the Future. Our bronze sponsors are Amino Max, Purdue Agribusiness, Origination Inc., Phileo, Bulkhem, and The Milk Group. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide. We hope that you consider them in your formulation decisions. So let me introduce our co-hosts today, this morning. Um, Elena has joined Hudai, uh, my, my co-worker Lynn Gilbert, and um, Sean Lee, and Tom. So I'm going to ask, um, as I wait for some more questions, I do have one. I'm going to um, give, give, I guess, Elena first. Um, first bit of discussion, because I imagine she has some questions from, um, from, from the Italian side. Elena, hi. Hi, Marianne. So I will start with questions then. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, I was impressed, uh, starting from the Michigan uh, farm, about the system that um, you put it together, uh, also for the cows management and so on. Uh, but since you have uh, two different perspectives, so the US and the Russian one, uh, I was curious about the um, labor and uh, how you managed them, uh, if uh, you uh, have also uh, the opportunity to train them and if you see any difference uh, and uh, if you have to, you know, uh, find or uh, adapt, uh, you know, your system to the different countries. Uh, and also if uh, working with, uh, you know, women, uh, you know, a, a farm managed all uh, for, um, from women, uh, you know, if you see the difference uh, and uh, if so, uh, which one? Thank you. Well, I heard the question. Thanks for the question, by the way. Uh, let's say like this, the labor in Russia is not expensive, but a skilled personnel, it's very hard to find, let's say like this, a simple task, yes, you can find the people to work on a farm, not a problem, but a skill is a problem. For women, women, I love how they do work, they're actually much better and gentle with the cows than guys working here, I, I do have experience with that too. So I would prefer actually the girls milking cow than our boys. Mm -hmm. um, I, in the United States, labor always been a problem. You know that I'm not gonna explain a lot. Um, uh, scale people actually in the United States a lot more, you can have uh, more help with that than in Russia. What else I missed on the questions? Ah, oh, if yeah, the pay, the pay, like, for example, there is a lot easier, for example, in Russia, hire five, 10 guys and make a job like one skid loader here in the United States. It's um, not very, uh, let's say like this, with an um, three, $400 a month, you can hire the employee in Russia on the farm, do the duty, simple task. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, so I saw that uh, switching to diet formulation, uh, uh -huh. that, uh, uh, you, in, you, in Russia, you use a very few amount of uh, corn silage, am I correct? 
is it uh, because of the temperature and uh, you know the um, country condition or is it a choice well you know the russia is uh, maybe only 30 percent of the land you can use for crops the rest almost frozen so mm -hmm. in this area particularly you can still grow corn silage pretty well but it's not enough so <laughs> lots of farms feeding with a uh, grass type of silages and then uh, more to the south, they grow corn pretty well. You can see a lot of them. So it all depends how much you have on the farm. You either add it more or make it shorter, just to get something else to blend it, just to have it in the diet. Yes, thank you. And uh, one last question about the uh, pro since uh, you know we are uh, uh, dealing with proteins uh, high, you know, cost. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Um, about uh, the soy uh, use uh, in your diets. Uh, so uh, do you um, prefer canola uh, only for the, the cost, of course, uh, or um, there is a, a specific reason? Let's say like this. For uh, last year, the price went up so crazy. Nobody expected. And then uh, in Russia, they even have uh, issues to get in soybean meal to the to the feed to the cow. So you had no choice sometimes just to feed more canola. And then while we feed in canola, I don't see any issues with lactating. We still keep productions. But if you switch to the sunflower meal, then you see a little bit of issues. So sunflower cannot replace uh, soybean meal and the canola meal. You can add it. It's very common feed in Russia, by the way, the sunflower meal. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't see any issues uh, to replace soybean meal with a canola meal. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Thank, thank you, Elena. Um, thank you also, Vadim. Um, let's, um, Hudai, thank Hi. you for attending. And would you, would you have some questions? Yes, I have. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Vadim about his uh, success. You know, it is not easy even to manage one farm, one dairy farm. Now he's managing three, two farms and on different countries. <clears throat> uh, I would like to learn how much of your his time to spend for each farm. Uh -huh. Well, in Russia, I have a partner that is my hands, my eyes, and uh, he's a very talented person. So he does help me a lot. I am involved maybe a couple hours a week just to overseas. And then uh, in Russia, I spend most of the time on Beaver Creek farms and a few farms, oh, not few farms, one up north and one little bit to the south in Michigan. Um, and uh, it takes a little bit of time to manage uh, labs because I have in three places, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. <laughs> and again, all about people. I have a very good, um, let's say like partners so, or uh, friends and employees on all uh, station, wherever I do. So in Russia, occasionally I do help uh, when I fly there. I walk to the dairies, but it's usually happened maybe every three months. And then I spend, of course, days on the farms. But um, daily basis or weekly basis, it's maybe one, two hours just overseas what's going on. Okay, thank you. So there are some questions here. So when do you get your pregnant calves to the calving area? How many days before calving, expected calving days? Uh, you mean the, to close up or uh, are you talking about first lactation? You know, period? you have some cows in the close up period and their uh, calving is coming. Yes, we move them to close up and to prior to 21 days, 14 to 21 days, and then uh, move to actually calving area, like with the first signs of calving. Like uh, you see the water bags pushing start hardly often or water ba bags is broken. Then the, that's the time to move to the calving facility on the straw. Okay. How long do you keep the uh, fresh cows in the fresh groups? Uh, I, we would let the first lactation animals fresh on their own by their supervising, not touching her, up to eight hours. 
with the cows we let them freshen on their own if they have a progress about six hours what i mean by pro progress if you see it one by one every 30 minutes every hour there is a little more feet, face show up, eyes show up, ears show up, head pop up. You don't touch her at all. Since she stopped doing any progress, then you need assistant. So we were really, really rarely actually helping cows to fresh on their own. Six to eight hours, that's what we trying to do. Okay, I mean, uh, you know, you have a fresh, <clears throat> when did the lactating cows? You have one fresh cow and high groups and Oh, I see, I see. In the fresh yeah, pens, I, stay in the in, fresh yeah. groups, you know, I mean, uh, this one. <clears throat> yeah, in the, in the fresh pens, they stay no longer than 10 days. If cows stay longer than 10 days, she must have a reason. Either ametritis, she's still on a treatment uh, like Exceed or XNL. If not, 9, 10 days, she leave the fresh pen. Go to open groups, uh, open pen, breeding pens, I call them, where they get bred. And then as pregnant, she moved to the pregnant group and from there to dry cow pen. So 10 days in the fresh pen. Okay. So you apply one dry cow diets for all dry cows, the far off mm -hmm. cows and the uh, close up cows. Correct. Yeah. You know, what I know is that the uh, energy control diet of Gordy Jones mm -hmm. is uh, just for far off dry cows, I think. But now you're applying it to the all dry cows. Mm -hmm. And so you are jumping from 10% starch to 27% of starch in the fresh diet. Do you have any special uh, thought yeah, I, behind I, of I, this? Occasionally, I do see the little bit of uh, digestion issues in the fresh pan, uh, but it's actually come out by itself with a one, two days because you're switching diet so dramatically, like, like say like this, from 11, 13% of starch to 27. And I would say it's probably about 10 to 15% of cows that has a little bit loose manure. We're using simply boluses for diarrhea and it's went away with any issues. It doesn't lead me to the later problem to the cows. So actually, you know, your fresh cow diet starch is about 27, uh, 20%. 20 yes. percent. Uh, ferment, fermentable starch, you know. Yeah. And what else? So, you know, between this, your two farms, one in this Russia and in, in the States, you have different starch level on, for high producing cows. You have about uh, fermentable starch at 20% 20.7% and 18.4% in states. Yes. Why? Why is that? <clears throat> um, you know, we try start feeding cows. If, for example, like I take a new dairy and then uh, the starch level, uh, I would like to start about 26%. And if cow doing well and responds well we increase it almost up to 30%. And then also this year, especially, I noticed that corn in Russia is not as high starch as supposed to be. We expected like 75% of starch um, in the corn, but sometimes we want to test that it's about 45 to 50% of starch in that corn. And then um, plus digestibility of corn itself is very low too. So. Sometimes if you see the starch in a diet, it doesn't mean that it works like supposed to be works. And <laughs> yeah. th that's what it is. We should look at the cows first, I believe, than, than at the figures on uh, any, any software to, to figure out the calculation. Yes, diet. correct. Yeah. yeah, they doing well. Actually, I feel like they, need, they could take a little bit even more starch, but a little scared. Yeah, also I think the butter fat percentage in the milk in the Russia is about, you have more than 4%, I think. Correct, yes. It's compared to the 3.6% in the States. So you have higher starch in Russia and higher butter fat level. Correct. And then also, if you notice in the video, the cows in Russia, their body condition score is a little bit heavier too, oh, let's yeah. say quarter pound. And that, that's what I, I had maybe a couple, three years ago in the United States too. When we had heavier cows, I would say heavier, maybe quarter pound. 
butter fat is actually a lot better shows in the milk than skinnier cows. So fatter cows gives fatter milk. That's what I've seen it. Like maybe it sounds goofy, but whatever. Okay. We'll leave the science behind. And the last question is that about, you know, when you showed us the video from your milking parlor, double 60. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that uh, you are using uh, teeth preparation prep systems. Mm -hmm. the teeth do, you get a, yeah. do, you, do you get a really good results from this system or? Truth, I don't know, we should say out loud, I would call it necessary evil. They really help me to do the routine. The people do exactly the same procedure, but a quality, it's still, I wish it could be better. But I would use them, let's say like this, I would use them if I, I don't have any choice to not use them like this. If I'll use the old fashioned forced fit, the towels, pretty deep, <laughs> it'll be, I, I would never be able to milk cows through. So. Yeah, right. Okay, thank you, Vadim. No, you're welcome, anytime. Thank you, Hadai, for your questions. Um, I do have a few questions in my window, but I want to also um, invite Sean Lee, our, our co-host joining us from China with um, any questions. Sean, do you have some, some questions or, or anything you would like to share with, with Vadim? Well, no, for now, you go ahead, or maybe later. Okay, thank you. I'm going to tackle a few of my questions and then um, ask Tom if he would like to um, get, get involved. And also, let's see, um, and Lynn. <laughs> so first of all, one of the questions that came in, and I believe this was when you were at the Russian Dairy, you spoke of... Um, the protein levels, are you talking about true or crude protein? Well, those one, yeah. In Russia, they actually measure just the crude protein. So it's it's probably more likely it's crude protein, not the true. I'm sorry, I did answer wrong. It's I answered true. No, it's probably crude because they don't divide it on ammonia on the side. So it's a okay. crude, 3.3, .3, it's a crude protein. All right, Th thank you. Um, next question is, um, what about the age at first calving for both farms and what's the average age of the milking cows and number of lactations? Okay, there is a very similar 23 months we are fresh in first lactation animals. The, uh, in Russia, we have 2.6, like, I'm sorry, in the uh, US, we have 2.6 lactations um, at, on all, overall and then in Russia, it's 2.4. There is a, quite a few animals get called because of um, feet. Like you, you could see the legs, they uh, have a using mattresses. This is not very friendly and cows, average lactation is going a little bit down because of that. What else was on the questions? Um, let's see, let's see, age of milking cow, uh, age at first, for Freshening, did you cover that? Yeah, 23 months of age freshening and on the first lactation. And then, uh, yes, every okay. lactation, every lactation 2.6 and 2.4. All right, Th thank you. Um, more questions about why sunflower meal cannot replace the soybean meal. Is it the low, low crew protein and high fiber or are there other problems? And do you face more mycotoxin issues with sunflower meal? No, not a mycotoxin at all. Actually, I ran quite a lot of mycotoxin samples all over Russia from uh, one part to another part. There is a mycotoxin is not an issue in Russia. Don't know why, maybe colder climate, something doing with that. But uh, why it's not replaced, don't know. If I replace one-to-one -one canola, for example, to sunflower, boom, I'm losing about two kilos of milk. Maybe it's amino acid, um, yeah. Inclusions uh, different. Totally is. I'll jump. I'll jump in there, Vadim. Uh -huh. if, if if you look at the, the amino acid content of sun, it's crap for lysine. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's terrible. It's it's terrible. So you're gonna have the same crude protein between that and canola, and you will always have less milk with sun. I agree, hundred percent. That's what I hear practically. And then what else? But it's very cheap. So you. 
<laughs> they push in everyone who talks to you, they push in to use it as much as you can. They just screw your hands. But no mycotoxins on them. Mm -mm. Okay. Thank you. Um, Tom, I love to hear you your you share your thoughts. You haven't, I don't know if you've been to Russia, but you've No, I have not, but most of my questions have already been all of my questions have been asked. Damn it, Hadine. <laughs> We have to fix it, Tom. <laughs> uh, so I, when when um, Hudai asked questions about the um, the dry cow ration, Tom, did you discuss that some in your February video, or am I? Oh, I think I talked that? about it a little bit, but and, and that was the one that was the one where I was going to go. Uh, but uh, Hudai got that question, and, and and I was like, well, that that would be something that would be best discussed with Vadim over a bottle of vodka and and, <laughs> and time. Yep, and a pickle, or olive, yep. And a pickle. Uh, horseradish <laughs> vodka, horseradish <laughs> vodka. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's early in the morning for horseradish vodka. Never. Uh, and and I like horseradish and like vodka, so I'm not sure how I feel about that. Probably it's fine. Um, <laughs> anybody? Oh, we'll, we'll have to make some then. Oh, that yeah. sounds like a great idea. Uh, <laughs> anybody have any additional questions, thoughts, comments? I love welcome them. Um, no, I'll 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 I'll, I'll ask one. Vadim, in, in in Russia, what do you see are the biggest challenges to getting more milk? knowledge how to actually do the dairy run the dairies that, that it's like i said it before about um, employees and labor this is a maybe it will be sounds a little bit not good for russia but not enough skilled people to manage dairies and it's one point and the second is a restriction from government how to manage there is lots of rules you can follow like you cannot do that you cannot do that that's kind of not helping either a rest of them it'll be beautiful land there's lots of crops beautiful climate cows gonna love this place it just need to be a little help for farmers to with the knowledge and let them do what they have to do that's that's what i'm most in russia problems Cool. Yeah, I think that's somewhat of a problem everywhere. Yeah. Um, but let's go to um, some questions from, um, or do, Marcos, do you have any questions or comments? And Vadim, by mm -hmm. golly, you do a fantastic job. We're going to get you to do those tours all the time. I'm well, very impressed. <laughs> thanks. Next time, maybe I could do a little bit better. I, know I, I thought you did very, very well. Uh, thank you. So, hi, Marcos. How are you? Marcos? Okay. Um, I don't think Marcos hears me. Um, let's see. So to start off with a few questions, and if you want me to go to any place in particular in the um, in the video, I can try to zone in on that. I'm just leaving it here on this page um, because that's where it ended up. Um, Vadim, can you um, share with us a little bit more about some herd factors um, like age at first calving in both the Russian farm and at Beaver Creek and your average cow lactation and how long they stay in the herd? Mm. Okay. At the Beaver Creek, we have a 2.6 lactation average in, uh, within 29% of first lactation cows in the herd right now. Average in a calving, it's about 23 months old. And in Russia, it's a little bit less, like um, 2.4 average lactation because of a uh, bedding. You see how the, the house in, on the mattresses, it kind of grew tough for a feed. And you have to call them a little bit early. Not too many cows stay after six lactations. They they should go. But um, average of a freshening, uh, first lactation is about 23 months as well. Thank you. Um, as a breeding 
similar between the two herds um, in terms of cow genetics? It's yes, it's a hundred percent a high Holstein pure breed, but here at the Beaver Creek, we're using precinct offsync at the uh, Russian dairy. We use the hundred percent offsync synchronization and breed hundred percent cows on offsync, double offsync. So that's a little difference. And um, you you referenced the the calf facility in the Russian um, at the Russian farm at Legend. Mm -hmm. um, how um, do you, let's see, what was I, how, how is the calf raising there? You said you had a pretty good, pretty low mortality rate. Oh, yes. um, they do it extremely well. It's, it's all about, if you care a lot, you do the best, you clean well, you feed them well, you follow the protocols. The mortality is, survival rate is 98% by 60 days when they go winning for milk. And then the DOA, it's uh, within 3%. Mm -hmm. uh, in my farm at the Beaver Creek, we have it even higher. I think like mortality DOA within 4 or 5%. Usually when hot days is common on the summer, July and August, we have a little bit of higher early freshening, then mortality goes a little bit over 5%. But uh, during the cold days, we're within 3 4% of DOA. That's... Uh, Oh okay, yeah, um, yeah. They they seemed very comfortable and content when, and maybe it's the feeder. Do, what do you um, question? What do you end up doing with bull calves in Russia? Are you using sex semen or do you raise them? Sex semen using for first lactation. I mean, springers animals. That's one hundred percent. Three breedings use the sex semen. The rest of them is just convenient. And the bull calves, they sell them uh, with a few days old to the grower. So they don't grow calves on this facility, bull calves, just the heifer calves, 100% for themselves. Do those um, do those bull calves end up going um, as beef or? A, yeah. A, oh, yeah. Yeah, a little bit about, I think, in, we know nothing about that sort of thing in Russia. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty much similar. But what's interesting is some people do not, do not uh, castrate them. They don't make them steers. They grow them like a normal bulls because Russian market likes leaner meat and uh, the beef. So mm -hmm. that, that makes them a little leaner. So they don't do nothing with the bull calf. They just grow them as it is. And they grow faster too, don't they? If they yes, still have... yes, they do. They do. Yeah. Um, are you trying to expand the herds? Or are you? Um... A, a little bit constricted by environmental type um, regulations or factors. Yeah. What are the limiting factors on your herd size in Russia? Well, right now, in, in Russia, oh my God, it's uh, last data I saw it's 2.8 million cows that are actually are in Russia right now, milking cows. And then they are involving lots of money to the uh, dairies and building a lot of them, modern dairies. I show you a farm that's not a brand new one. It's maybe like six, seven years old, but new modern dairies that build up, it's actually will be on the sand. And then uh, with a, we do actually have even one absolutely 100% robot carousel in there in Russia as well. So the modern dairies is built nicely, but old, old facilities still kind of have issues with the mattresses. I hate mattresses, by the way. I just can't stand them. Um, so most of the employees there, we talked about that a little bit this morning. Is it um, like in our country here, we see a lot of people coming from perhaps Guatemala or Mexico and serving as the milkers and the farm workers. Um, do you have are the, are the people that are working on the farms doing the day-to-day -day jobs, are they local or not? Well, are they native Russians or are they coming from other countries? 99% is usually native. Uh, occasionally we do have from some um, other countries, but uh, usually you use the like, local help. And as you saw, it's most of them just a uh, woman. Yeah, the girls is, uh, love to work on the farm, like with the calves and milking facility, milk cows, that, that's his primary job. On the tractors and feeding, yeah, then other guys involved. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Well, we thought we we recognized one of the women working in the parlor. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she looked a little like Lynn, um, if Lynn were older or heavier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, are do the crop? Do you do Russian dairies typically grow their own crops, or are they um, purchasing from specialists? I would tell you even more. They're not trying just to grow crap. They they try and go do do everything in the farm, like grow calves, and then they do the meals, own meals, and then with the milk they try and put the plants in the processed milk as well, and uh, sell the product. Uh, like a yogurt on the market instead of selling to somebody else. Like a big companies try and do all in one, everything includes. It's not like in the United States, you try and divide it. Like I'm not raising my calves, for example, right? Send it to a grower. In Russia, no, you'll do it yourself. If you wanna do grinding corn, for example, even grinding simple corn, they do it in a, in a facility, in a dairy, instead of buying the ground corn. Everything they try and do it, inside instead of get a parts and do it like for example just the milking cow so that that's a different right now between two countries and and the um that yeah that that whole concept is a pretty neat idea um typically is milk consumed as a fluid product or you see it going into yogurt cheeses cultured um things like cottage cheese what, what is the typical use of dairy over there? I do everything, but I know we are short on milk, fluid milk as well. And then uh, use the lots of powder milk to get a, just sell as milk. Um, we'll definitely need more <laughs> dairies build up. Is it all within, is most of the milk within country or are you importing? Uh, importing, yes, importing, ah. yes. And where's the primary source imported from? We, it's, it's an interesting question. I cannot tell you exactly question, but um, it, it goes from Europe a lot. I know the powder, milk powder goes from Europe quite a lot. Okay. Um, I think Paula has a few questions. Um, Paula is the co-host in Argentina. Hi, Vadim. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. We have a question from Matthias. Uh, don't you think uh, if you if you split the the herd in more uh, small herd or small smaller pen uh, by days in milk, milk yield? and you would design a different diets for each pen. Don't you think it would be more um, cheap, uh, cheaper? It would be cheaper for you to feed the, those cows? Mm -hmm. I got a question. No, I don't think so. We tried on this dairy, I'm working about seven years. And then before I start, managers dairy, we had probably five or six diets for cows. Some of them are low lactating, mid lactating, high lactating. Uh, it was a big mess. First, what I did, I um, improved reproduction. We um, get the uh, cows get pregnant and then I changed to one diet. And then that was so efficient right now. I do believe cow eat as she milks, if, if you feed them right. If she's, uh, for example, makes you 45, 50, 60 kilos of milk, she probably intake her will be about 32 kilograms. If cow starts slowing down on production, she'll start eat less. And then we actually last three, four years have an issue to gain weight on cows. They go to dry with a body condition score, three, three and a quarter, which is I like to see them a little bit. Oh, fatter, bigger, like you would say. So, and then what makes cow gain weight and losing milk? I think when you start move her from pen to pen, once you move her from high lactating pen to low lactating pen, she definitely will lose about two kilos within a few days and will never get back to that um, 
level where she used to be. And that's extra energy she gets from stopping producing milk, it goes in body weight. So I've seen a lot of them farms that actually dealing with a body condition score four, four and a quarter when they start playing with the diets. So my goal is actually get improved reproduction and put them on one diet. It works amazing for me on many, many dairies. If I answer okay. questions. Yes, yes, I think so. Thank you very much. I, I have another question. Uh, mm -hmm. do, you, do you recognize differences in forage quality between uh, comparing forages from the US and, and Russia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, huge difference. Not many farmers can, can make good quality forages in Russia. I don't know why, don't ask me, because they know exactly how to do it. They have a, all they need to do it and it's still not doing well. There is some farms who knows how to do it. They milk in, believe me, more than we do, 40 to 45 kilograms easily, but uh, it, still learning process, let's say like this, to get them forages get done well in Russia. Related to that, are the seed um, seed varieties the same or similar to what we have available here? You know, in Russia right now, you can buy whatever you want. Of course, it's, it'll be more expensive if you buy uh, pioneer seeds or uh, any other source of seeds. You can get it. It's not a problem at all. But even have a good value of the harvest and you know like corn silage they, they still cannot put it right on the place I, I don't know what's happened with those guys they don't think I, th I, th I think the biggest problem they don't think it's important to put the good quality of forages that's what the issue is from not from a field it's from harvesting and how you pack it how you cover it how you pay attention to the details that's what the issue is why they're not success yet how um now, in terms of, we, we looked at freestalls and you showed us freestalls. How common are things like organic dairies where they have cows out grazing or um, out there in pasture? Few. Yeah, there is few. Definitely there is a few pasture-based uh, dairies and they, they're doing well. But see, because of shortage of milk, there's people don't have even choice to choose either as an organic or just a normal farm milk you know so if you're short on anything you'll buy everything if there is no mm -hmm. huge difference of price of milk as well and then there is lots of wet climate in russia so the grazing it turns so bad if it gets wet but but it, it i know a few days they pretty successful they're robotic dairies, by the way. They, they're using pasture and they're robot milkers. So, oh, neat. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, so following up some of the questions that Paula had about forage and forage quality, um, most specifically, how do you see any differences in NDF digestibility? And also maybe even talk a little bit about, do you, do you find issues with um, soil or high ash um, content in some of the the, har the forages because of the yeah. harvest methods? It, it is high content, but it's most of them because um, the field worker, they don't, uh, let's say like this, when you put the seeds, I don't know English words, when you put the seeds on, you, you're supposed to level it up the ground mm -hmm. so it will be flat. They still leave lots of bumps and uh, hills then when you start harvesting, then that's where the ash content is come to the forage. Ah. They just pick it up, grab it from a rakes from a field. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, then the digestibility is actually awesome because it's a colder climate. The grasses, UNDF mm -hmm. to 40, it's zero. It's 100% digestible. The grass silages. Yeah. Oh, that, that's really, really interesting. Um, well, Vadim, I, I'm waiting. Um, Marcos, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask? I think I skimmed right over you. Possibly not. 
<laughs> um, all right, I don't, unless I get some questions in my window, I think Paula has asked all the questions she had from her audience. Um, we had such a, it was such a tremendous tour, both of Beaver Creek and, and the legend dairy in Russia that I think everybody just really enjoyed that and, and are taking some things home to digest. But um, the Dean, again, thank you. Oh, Marcos does have questions. <laughs> Marcos, do you want to unmute yourself? I cannot unmute you. And you could, um, you, you, Marcos, you have to. Okay, sorry about Good. that. Got it. I, Perfect. I, I was expecting you to open me. <laughs> I, I yeah, Zoom <laughs> took away my ability to do that. Now. Okay, so, yeah. sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Marcos. Um, th thanks, Virgin, for the presentation and for the tour and for sharing your diets with us. Actually, I, I have a question about the diet. I found it interesting, mm -hmm. your pre-partum diet. You seems that you look for low calcium and, and you use a lot of amino plus as a, as a protective soy protein source, right? Correct. And don't use an ionic salt. So what's your opinion about that? I, I think your sulfur levels were quite low. So it was really fast, so I couldn't see really well. That's why I'm just would like to know your opinion, like in a big herd, we have yeah. a lot of experience on an ionic salts and this calcium strategy or increasing MP supply, if it's really a goal, if you look for that, I think it would be nice to, yep. yeah, to understand how is your feelings, how, what do you think that works, what do you think that's not necessary? Uh, I have a couple of words on that. I got a question. Yes, uh, I mean, a plus we add in just because we need a MP at least 400 and higher. So that's a whole reason why we add in amino plus. And I do love antiotic soul diets. We fed them. This is the one diet is only last year we're trying to implement in a Beaver Creek. Before I used the, maybe like four years in a row, we fed with antiotic soul diets. And then it was a great success till something happened. And I know what happened. I will, I, I also, always when I feed antiotic salts, we like to keep pHs is about 5.5, 5.7. And then uh, eventually, it seems like this number start getting higher and we added more salts and it did not work. We added a little bit more salts and it didn't work till, I, I know now later, till we get it so many, then cows actually fell apart. And then, then we decided to try to go one cow diet. And then uh, with a one cow diet, it helps me to manage cows, moving them. Like it, it's a one diet. It doesn't matter when I can put the fresh, far off cow to the pre-fresh. And then this has helped me with a manage of a grouping. If I am too full on the far off, I can move them to pre-fresh and then number of cows is fine. And diet is the same, there is no stress. This is only one, let's say benefit from one cow diet. I do believe we're gonna switch within the months, uh, getting two cows diets, two, two, two diets, uh, trying a little bit different. Far off and pre fresh will be fed different. It's still kind of on a low calcium diet yet. We never give up that early. What else about antiotic soul diets? I, I would be changing it without heart beating to antiotic soul diets to any moment. It just it's very expensive right now. It's adding probably dollar, dollar twenty more per cow if I'll switch it right now to the antiotic soul diets. Okay. Thank you. And what about feed adjectives? What do you think like is essential, like buffers, amino acids, yeast? What what have you been feeding? What are your choices? Are we adding, yes. Yeah, we add in amino acids, uh, lysine, methionine, and uh, we feed a little bit of blood for um, lactating cows, yes. And then uh, thinking about maybe switch completely to blood right now and take off amino acids because blood on the market is cheaper right now. It's all strategy right now in the United States. I don't know if you're familiar or not, just to get the lowest possible price because it's killing us, like literally killing us. Without doing anything, we increase probably $2 per feed cost per cow per hundred weights. With a 
uh, within like eight, nine months. We're not trying to get it more expensive. We just try and get it cheaper and it still goes so expensive. And milk doesn't follow that price yet. So what about Russia and Europe? Have been people being aggressive on amino acids there also? Well, way too expensive. Uh, amino acids, they don't, they don't make amino acids in Russia themselves, right? So it's all exported. And there is a three, four hands before it goes to the farmer. The price getting is so expensive. I tried, I tried, like say, hey guys, let's, and then I calculated, it's like, holy smoke, we cannot afford it. Mm -mm. Can you feed blood meal in Russia? Yes, yes, we do. You, you can, right? For, for us here, it's forbidden in Brazil because of medical disease. Like, can, can you feed animal protein in Russia? Yeah, it's forbidden for Belarus, I know for sure, and probably for Ukraine as well. But in Russia, you still feed them. You can still feed them. Mm -hmm. And what about the, the hosting genetics in, in Russia? Like, is it Russian hostings or? Uh, are the American hostings like anywhere? I, I found the cows a little bit shorter. And yeah. is it a is a, is, a, is Russian so, genetics, right? It's it's in the beginning we had a black and white breed like dual purposes. It's milk and uh, meat, but then lots of crossbreed on the Holsteins, and then imported lots of cattle from Europe, uh, Germany, Holland. Um, and then the, lots of cattle from the United States and Canada as well. I know they sent them crazy years ago. So it's some on crossbred, some on pure Holsteins. But the semen comes from the United States today or it comes from a Russian bulls? We have a representative of all American companies, Alta, GeneX, ABS, uh -huh. Select Tires, CMAX, everyone, wherever you want it. And semen, I looked at the quality, it's about similar, so. So it's basically the same. Yes. Yeah. Sa same American genetics everywhere. Yep. And the, we found some, in, how are you tracking particle size the diet? I, I, I was a kind of uh, your silo unloader. I was kind of scary how, we, how what, what that thing does with particle size. Yes, so we, what do you think? It, da it, da it damage a lot or not? Like it, we have some of those here also, and and how are you tracking it at the farm? Like how you formulate fiber, and are you checking anything in the diet using the Penn State or Absolutely. how how do, how how do you look at particle size in general? Yeah, Penn State. Penn State we're using every two weeks, and then when we are there on the farm, Penn State absolutely plus. You cannot go without straw. If you can see, you're right. It, it does get little smaller particles. But again, if they would be critical, we would never see fat 4.1. They chew it, they chew in extremely well. Um, mm -hmm. the, the manure is absolutely no question about with that. The high starch, and then with adding about half a kilo straw in a diet, it's a, it's over the pound in America, so it does help to get a PNDF in a diet. Uh, there's another point. I, I saw your diets are running like 0 0.6, 0 0.7 forage NDF as a percentage of body weight. Do you shoot for that or like it just happened and do, do, do you have a goal on that number? Like no, you, we, where, no. where, where you want to be? Actually, honestly, I don't look up at these numbers. Okay. I'm looking for yeah, looking for total forage in the diet. Yes, absolutely. This one I look, but uh, from uh, forage percent of NDF from forage, I'm not looking for these numbers. Okay. Th thanks a lot, and it was a very nice presentation. Nice to know a little bit about Russia. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank okay. you, Marcos, for asking um, such good questions. Um, question that we had from one of our listeners. Where in Russia are the dairies that have the really um, high DNDF? High DNDF? It's a Lipetsk region, close to Belarus. Okay. Those ones, extremely nice forages of uh, grass silages. Anything up north, um, not the south. So if you look at the map, the south region is not. 
but um, close to Moscow, let's say like this, and actually northern Moscow, those one is really good the grasses. If you cut them right point, almost you end up to 40 zeros. It's like a rocket fuel. Mm -hmm. um, how, how are the incidences of DAs and, and other sort of metabolic type problems in in your in the Russian herd? Occasionally it happens, yes. But right now, DAs is not a problem at all. We have maybe on a thousand cow dairy, uh, maybe one, two a week, but um, our peas has increased up to probably 8% right now. It used to be like three, four. It, it, because months ago we had a low dry matter intake. What okay. happened, we, we still kind of can figure out yet why the cow suddenly stopped eating. Maybe like a palatability of feed was changed. They changed in a in bunker of silages. That that could be doing too. And you mentioned this morning um, there was a little bit of a discussion about the high use of sunflower um, meal or seed seed mm -hmm. meal, um, and that that wasn't necessarily ideal, but it's yeah. cheap. It's not a good replacement from canola or soybean meals, but um, it, it's source of protein. It, it, it probably will fit very well for um, heifers, for growing heifers, but um, for lactating cows, as soon as you replace 100% canola to sunflower meal, you're losing about up to two kilos of milk mm. without anything else. Gosh. That, that's a that's a significant drop. Yes. Um, unless I get more questions from co-hosts or from um, listeners, you probably have more work to do, given how yes, busy you are. I do. We start getting uh, chopped uh, Whitley trade now, so I'll be running. Ah. Back to yeah. So you probably have to go. Um, I want to thank everybody who joined us um, and look for us in coming webinars but um vadim thank you so much this was fantastic thank you thank you marianne and thank you all right for everybody. All right yeah. thank you everybody uh i will see you next month or maybe next week everybody thanks again bye marcos bye paula bye lynn bye all everybody right. thanks vadim <laughs> bye <laughs>